Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time it's episode 152, and we're going to talk about living van life on your terms. Folks, this is kind of what it's all about, and I will explain how things are turning against this. We'll also talk about the importance of having an emergency exit in your van, even if it's just a plan, a tale from the road about a place that I hope you never go to, and yes, the long-awaited product review of Bar Shampoo. I know I know, you've been all waiting for that one. Hi folks, thank you very much for coming back. Uh, everybody who has asked me for stickers, they are in process. I've received quite a few requests actually, so it's going to take me a bit of time, but I will be getting your stickers out as soon as I can. If you are listening to this for the first time and just hearing about the stickers, I am giving away Hook Waka Bang stickers that is a Euro decal with a question mark, a greater than symbol, and an exclamation point, and it has deep meaning, I promise. And I will send one of these to you if you send me your mailing address, and no, I'm not collecting them. All you have to do is send that address to jeff at builttogo.com. That's two T's, not three, not one, and I will get that out to you. Also, as a bit of news, uh, I am getting inundated with people wanting to interview me or have me interview them or whatever. It's kind of strange. I don't know why this is happening right now. But I'm saying yes a lot more often than I used to. And uh, so let me tell you what's coming up. Um, Tomorrow, I'm having an interview with a woman named Jess who has a solution for off-the-grid internet use. And I already had a little pre-interview with her, and she claims that they just use the internet like they're at home. They stream whatever they want. They just don't worry about it because they've got a good solution. Now, I expect this isn't going to be a cheap solution, but I think we can all learn something from how she went about this. And uh, I will have that up probably next week. We're going to record it tomorrow. Also, you may be familiar with FNA Van Life. That's Frankie and Alex and their dog Paco. And they are currently, I think, I believe they're traveling through Central America right now, but they've asked to do kind of a co podcast type of thing because they have a podcast as well so we're going to check that out um they're fairly big youtube stars you can search on fna van life and see what they're about and yes they have one of the cutest snaggletooth dogs in the world and you know how can you go wrong with that but today i want to talk about a semi-serious issue here i mean you know i like to be upbeat on this show but sometimes i i just get a little disappointed at what i see in regards to van life and its reputation. So every once in a while, I'll go onto YouTube and I will type in van life and just search on that. And partially that's to reset the algorithm so it won't keep showing me videos of some weird esoteric topic I searched on. But also I want to see what's kind of trending, what the algorithm is giving me regarding van life. And what I'm seeing is almost all negative videos about van life. For example, I go into YouTube type in van life and I see I see from Chrome from Van City Van Life, you know, one of the biggest YouTubers there is for van life, people quitting van life because it's too hard. Off-grid reality check. Okay, well that that one video doesn't sound too bad and we know Chrome is certainly all about the van life, so that's not too bad. But then let's look and see what else comes up. Van life lessons learned the hard way. 10 reasons why van life sucks. Five lies of van life nobody talks about. The biggest enemy of van life. This is why I quit van life. It's been a total disaster. Van life YouTubers are full of shit. I tried van life. Here's why I would not buy one. Van life. Are you sure you want to do this? That's from Lady Bugout. I mean, you know, it's another really big kind of pro van life person. Is van life worth it? I'm not sure anymore. And on and on and on. And I don't know specifically why the algorithm is showing me all of these other than there are a lot of them. And I think it's because folks have figured out that if they type in something negative about van life, they get a lot of views. There's a lot of clickbait out there. And unfortunately, part of the way the algorithm works on YouTube is you kind of have to be a little bit clickbaity or you won't get any traction at all. But there's some major point being missed here about van life. And I definitely want to talk about that. So there's the big question. Why do people do van life? Why give up your comfortable house or apartment or whatever you're living in and then move into a tiny little vehicle? Why do that? Now, it has to always be said that some people don't have a choice. And again, these people who don't have a choice, I am all about making their lives as comfortable as possible. 
but we have to be able to separate them from people who do have a choice. It's a very, very different thing. Now, the people who do have a choice, why do they choose this? Well, those reasons are as varied as there are van lifers. But a lot of the YouTube folks and Instagram folks and whoever, they don't really treat it that way. They they treat it like we're all doing exactly the same thing. It's like, oh, I'm going to do van life. And that means that I'm going to get my shelter dog and I'm going to get in the van that I built myself. And it's beautiful and it has all my decorations in it. And we're going to go park on the beach for a week. And then ah, we're going to go to Baja and so on and so forth. That isn't van life. I mean, it is van life, but it doesn't define van life. What defines van life, I think, and this is just my opinion, I am certainly not the authority on all things van life, is living on your own terms. I think that's what it's really about for a lot of people. And when you decide that you're going to live life on your own terms, having a van is simply, no pun intended, the vehicle that gets you there. Now, you can decide you're going to live life on your own terms in any place. I mean, you could be in a house or an apartment or whatever. But what's different about a van is you can be as isolated or as involved as you like. For example, during the 2016 election cycle, I got into this trap where I had to watch cable news all the time and see what was going on. It became a sort of addiction. And this wasn't a good thing. I mean, that was an incredibly tumultuous time in the U.S., and honestly, I wasn't doing myself any good by watching this stuff. And, you know, the cable TV channels know this, and they're they're always trying to get you sucked in so you'll see more ads. I mean, that's how it works, right? But in a van, you have to make an effort to do almost everything. Everything takes a little bit more work in a van. I mean, that's just a truth. Therefore, you are actually doing the things you want to be doing, the things that are important to you and not just the things that are easy. So I think if I were living in a van in the 2016 election cycle, I don't think I would have been addicted to cable news because that would have been a whole lot of effort to do that. Sure, I might have read the news on my phone a couple times a day or whatever, but depending on where I was, there probably would have been huge times where I didn't do that at all. It's a way to live in your world and leave the larger world behind. Now, we can argue about whether people should stay informed or not, and, you know, how important voting is and all that. That's absolutely fine. But those are personal choices. I find that living in a big city, like Chicago, which I do, it's difficult to leave the world behind. I mean, I'm I'm in the world. Stuff is happening. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, stuff that affects me happens. Chicago has stuff that happens. It's on the news all the time, and I'm living in that. It's a little bit difficult just to leave the world behind. But when I lived in Vermont, it was very, very easy to just ignore the world news and just focus on your local things. Oh, so-and-so's cow escaped yesterday. You know, that's the news, right? Oh, we're going to get a lot of snow. I better put fuel in the generator. That's the kind of stuff that you could focus on living in Vermont, which is a very rural place if you've not been there. And I loved it. It was super nice. And I can't do that in Chicago as easily. But I can do it in my van. When I get in my van and shut the door and turn the key, I am literally driving my own destiny at that point in a way that I can't just living normal life in the city. So the reason I'm bringing this up is we seem to be in a cycle now where it's super popular to publish negative van life stories of all different kinds and just take them all with a grain of salt. Figure out what they're doing and then figure out more importantly what you're doing. How do these things overlap? Pay attention to the things that affect you and your journey and living life on your terms, but let the rest just slide by. I mean, in a way, it's kind of like cable news. They're going to give you the negative stuff so you'll keep watching and question. And, you know, when that happens and you get worried about it, like, oh, geez, van life the right thing for me? I mean, I've already built out half the van, but I see all these people having trouble. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Once you get in that mode, it's easy to get obsessed and you just keep watching more and more and more and more negative videos. Fine. Do that. Learn from them. But then I also want you to look at another kind of video. There's a whole new, well, not that new. They've been around for a couple of years. There's a whole series of van life videos where someone is living van life and they don't talk. 
all they do is go about their life in the van and you just watch. You watch them make their food. You watch them make their bed. I mean, it sounds kind of boring, right? Except that it's calming and peaceful. And for me, it makes me want to get out there in my van as soon as I possibly can. So curate your experiences, live life on your terms, and van life might be the best way to do that. You have to make that decision for yourself. Tech Talk. So I got my scamp. I've been talking about the scamp a lot lately because I'm thinking about how to finish renovating it. Um, it's in really good shape, but it, you know, it's, it's older. It's 90, 1993, so I, I have some things to do. But one thing that I saw in the scamps that I thought was interesting is, you know, these are small trailers and they have one door. So what if that door was on fire, right? I mean, I can't imagine how that could happen, but what if that door was on fire and you couldn't get out it? Or what if the trailer had tipped over onto the door? How could you get out? Because the windows don't open that wide. It's not like you can crawl out the window. And I suppose you could kick one out, but uh, no. It turns out that the scamp engineers thought of this and came out with a, a solution. And the vent hatch in most RVs, as you know, is 14 inches square. But in the scamp, it's 28 by 14. And the whole thing flips open and makes an emergency exit. I mentioned this on the Facebook group. Um, if you go to scamptrailers.com, you can actually buy one of these huge vents for 150 bucks, which I think is a great price. And it's, it's this massive vent that you can open up and it just makes this giant hole in your roof and it's easy to crawl through it. I mean, you might need some help getting up that high, but if the trailer was on its side, you'd have no problem crawling out it. And so this brings to mind two things. First off, consider one of these vents if you're putting a vent in your roof. Yes, it does take up a lot of vent space. It might interfere with your solar panels, but... It is really nice having like this pop-up massive hatch in the roof because you can get any kind of smoke out really quick or you can get a bunch of fresh air really fast. And yeah, it has a screen so you can leave it open too. Um, anyway, look at it. You'll see. It's just, a, it's just a big hatch. But the other thing is, and I, I want everyone to be very clear about this, you need to have several ways out of your van because you don't know what's going to happen. Now, it's a small place, right? It's not like a, a school where you need to have emergency exits and sirens and all that. But you do need to think, hmm, what am I going to do if this happens? In my van, and in many vans, the stovetop is right by the sliding door. And I only have one sliding door on the passenger side. If something catches fire there, like let's say there's a grease fire there, it could catch onto the door. And the way my door is, is I have to reach around the stove to grab the handle to open the door. I might not be able to reach that. And then I'm in this tiny little van that's filling up with smoke and burning plastic and whatever, and that's not good. So I have several ways out at this point. I can go out the front because I have a door there, although that might not be accessible. And I also have the back doors too. Now, you probably have these same things, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because I took time to think about this. I was sitting on the bench, and I was like, okay, how am I going to get out of here? And you should do that, too. I know some people like to chain their doors at night, um, and just be careful about that. If you're going to chain your doors and make them super secure at night, make sure that you can get them undone quickly in case of an emergency, because you might not have that much time to get out of there. Fires spread quickly and the air is gone very quickly in a van, and you're only going to have a matter of tens of seconds to get out of there. So that's my tech talk for this week. Make sure you know how you're going to get out of your van and have more than one door. Please, you need to have more than one door. Tales from the Road. So this tale from the road could actually be a place to visit, except I kind of don't want you to ever go to this place. And it, it hurts to say that, but uh, I will explain. So when I moved to Vermont in 2003, uh, we had some neighbors. You know, my whole family moved up there and, you know, there's been a divorce and everything. But at that time, we were a young family excited to start our lives in Vermont. And we met a neighbor couple who also had young kids and they had lived there a very long time. And so they were kind of showing us the stuff. 
And they said, hey, let's go for a walk in the woods, which is <laughs> everything's woods. So we didn't know where they meant. It wasn't like there was the woods. We lived in the woods. But they told us they were going to take us up a trail and uh, and take us to a place called Honey Hollow. Well, I, I had never heard of this. I don't think it's on any maps, and that's good. It was in the fall, and we walked up this lovely trail next to a very deep creek. I mean, the, it was in a deep ravine. I don't know how deep the water was, but... It was just very beautiful, typical Vermont scene, kind of what you would expect. And we went up the hill and then came down and wound around a little bit and went up another hill. And then as we're walking up the hill, one of the other couple says, okay, now stop and turn around. And we did. We stopped and turned around and had just the most amazing view Ever. I, I I mean, there's lots of amazing views. This view was a quintessential Vermont view. We were high on a hill overlooking a valley with another hill on the other side. Everything we saw was framed in fall color trees. And there was this beautiful old farmhouse on this sloping kind of grassy area with rocks poking out. And there was a statue of a kid on a sled kind of going down the hill. And it was one of those days where it was 72 degrees and the sun was up, but it wasn't hot and there was just a light breeze. It was just a perfect moment. And I thought, wow, I am going to remember this place. I love it here. I'm going to tell everybody about it. And then I thought, well, if I do that, this isn't going to be that place anymore. And I've seen this happen in real time. I once added a place to I Overlander in South Dakota. It was a rest area that was a set back from the interstate. It was a good place to stop. There weren't any no parking signs. And within 18 months of me putting that site on Overlander, it got shut down. They put up signs, no camping, no van life, get the hell out of here. You know, they basically got very angry about it because so many people had seen that post in I Overlander that they overwhelmed the place, threw trash everywhere, and ruined it. And I am not willing to let that happen to Honey Hollow. It is a special place, and uh, if you find it, good for you. But I would ask you to also keep it a secret. And this creates cognitive dissonance in me, because why should I get to enjoy this and not you? And I don't have a good answer for that, other than... Uh, it's a bit of a Schrodinger's cat situation, where if I reveal this, it goes away. And I'm not willing to let that happen. Underneath the statue of the kids sledding down the hill, there's a plaque. And it's written by the owners of the property. Apparently, this is a family property. It's in trust now. But this family has owned this property for over 100 years. And the plaque is pretty long. But it explains that they see this place as a responsibility. Their responsibility is to keep it looking the way it is now and to not let any development or anything else ruin it, including lots of tourists. And I decided I'm going to respect that. It's kind of a beautiful idea. And I still have the cognitive dissonance about it. I had this wonderful experience and I'm not willing to give you instructions on how to get there yourselves. But, you know, if you keep exploring, you're going to find some of those places for yourself. And when you do, well, then you've got the same difficult situation that I have. Do you share the secret garden with other people? Mm, hard to say. Product review. I promised, I promised I would buy some bar shampoo and test it out. So what I got was from the San Francisco Soap Company, just a bar of soap slash shampoo, and I got sandalwood and cedar scent. Very, very manly. And... I've been using it for a while now. I've been trying it out. And, um, well, I've got mixed feelings about this. I mean, it's kind of clever that you just have this one bar that does everything. And it does. Uh, so, yeah, let's talk about how well it works. As, as, a, as, a, as a soap, it, you know, it's a soap. It's heavily scented. Super heavily scented. I mean, I feel like I just put on cologne after I use this stuff. But it lathers up and it does all your soapy things just fine. As a shampoo... It's honestly a bit more like soap. <laughs> if you've ever washed your hair with ivory soap, you know how it leaves kind of that weird dull feeling in your hair, which I assume is soap. I don't know. Um, this does that same thing, and I was surprised because what's the shampoo part of this if it just acts like soap? Now, I found that if I wash my hair twice with it, that goes away, but then my hair seems really dry, and again, 
I'm a guy, I don't care about my hair. So if I'm noticing these things, if you are someone who does care about your hair, you're definitely going to notice these things. But it got my hair clean, you know, it certainly did the job, so okay. And then I thought, well, why would I ever use this? So in the context of van life, um, I don't think I would. I, it, it just doesn't save enough space that, you know, having a little bottle of shampoo, you know, a little bottle of white rain shampoo for a buck fifty is a heck of a lot easier and more pleasant to use than this. And this bar, I think, was $12, so it's, it's not cheap. So the only way I think this stuff is useful is if maybe you're, you're backpacking where weight is a huge, huge issue and you don't want to carry anything more than you have to. It might make sense there, but not this one. There's two reasons why I will not specifically recommend this one by San Francisco Soap Company. First is really dumb. So most of these bar shampoos that you buy come in a metal or plastic case. This one came in a cardboard box. Now, it's a very nice cardboard box. It has a lid that closes with magnets, and, you know, it's, it's a nice cardboard box. But it's cardboard, and you're putting in this wet piece of soap, and, of course, it gets stuck, and the box gets soggy, and I'm just like, how did they not think of this? This baffles me. And the other part is, the scent is so strong that it really is like wearing cologne. And I think that's not something you want when you're out in the woods, necessarily. I mean, maybe you do. You do you. Totally fine with that. But in general, you want to kind of eliminate strong scents in the woods because they can attract insects and things. So, yeah. As a concept, I can see some certain circumstances where bar shampoo can work and be an advantage. But in van life, I mean, I know space is limited, but it's not that limited. I think you're going to be better off keeping your soap and shampoo separate. A place to visit. So if you've ever driven I-80 across the country, which, you know, if you've ever driven across the country, you've probably used I-80. I mean, there's I-70 and I-90 that also do this, but I-80 seems to be the one that most people travel on. In Kearney, Nebraska, which is spelled Kearney, but it's pronounced Kearney, you have driven under this massive arch. <laughs> There's this just giant arch that crosses the road and you drive right under it. And uh, yeah, it's a tourist trap. Of course it is, but it's kind of cool. So I did stop there and I went and did the entire experience. You go into this massive parking lot and then there's a big gift shop. Shocker, I know. it's ma You can't even imagine that there's a gift shop there. You go through the gift shop and then it's 15 bucks, which seems a bit steep for me. You pay your 15 bucks and you go upstairs and there's kind of museum dioramas about the settling of the West. Now you can see some exhibits on the Pony Express and Route 66 and the driving of the Golden Spike and a little Main Street USA thing. There's all kinds of stuff like this and it's cute and fun and it's a nice break if you're driving really long distances. All that stuff is fine. I do note that they seem to kind of ignore all the people that lived here before the pioneers got here. I mean, they're mentioned somewhat, but they don't actually get their own exhibit, which I don't know, that seems a little strange to me. But there's one little hidden thing that I think actually almost makes the entire experience worth it. When you get up to the very top of the arch, there's a window that looks out over the highway and you look out this window and you are floating above this major interstate with semis and vans and everything driving underneath you. And it's kind of a cool experience. I mean, I can't think of too many other places where you can have that experience and be indoors. I mean, some of the oases, oases, some of the oases that used to exist, like Illinois used to have a bunch of them. You could kind of do that, but not at this scale. So yeah, that's pretty cool. A bonus tip, if you have more time and you're, you're kind of a slow traveler, which is actually a really good way to be, on the frontage road right by the arch is a firefighter's museum. And I probably should do a tale on the road about me visiting that place because I had a really weird experience there. But it's just this big giant room filled with firefighting apparatus of all different kinds and all different ages. And, you know, I think it was like four bucks. <laughs> I don't remember, but it was cheap and, and kind of interesting. In fact, I bet it, I would say it's more interesting than the arch itself. So you kind of get a two for one there. And then there's, there are some nice picnic areas too. So 
All in all, it's a good place to stop. If you're looking for a place to stop in Kearney, Nebraska, or near Kearney, Nebraska, which you will because you're going to need gas by the time you get there, check out the Archway. That's what it's called, the Archway. That's it. And that's at exit 275 on I-80 in, in Kearney. Resource Recommendation. All right, this is kind of a weird resource, but it could be useful for you, and uh, I just use this so I can talk about it first hand. It's called Square Mouth. Now, this is not sponsored, just to be clear, because Square Mouth does sponsor some... Stop it. Square Mouth does sponsor some things. No, I'm just somebody who uses it. Now, I've mentioned before, I'm a, officially a certified travel agent, blah de blah and um, I do have access to some types of insurance that other people don't, and I have those, and that's all fine and good, but this is for everybody, and it's so good that I use this as well. So it's called Squaremouth, squaremouth.com, and what you do is you go in there and you find insurance for your trip. Now, They have several kinds of insurance. They have insurance for the value of your trip. Like if you're, let's say you're going to go somewhere exotic like Galapagos. You're not going to bring your van to Galapagos. You're going to park your van. You're going to go to Galapagos. And you want to insure that trip because it's a lot of money. Well, Square Mouth will let you do that. You type in when you're leaving, where you're going, and they don't sell insurance. All they do is recommend policies that might fit you. And I'm sure they get a commission for that. I mean, I'm, I'm positive that's their business model. But they do a really good job. And you can insure the full cost of your trip, but you can also get types of insurance that you might not be aware of unless you do a lot of international travel, and that is repatriation insurance, which guarantees that they will get you home if you get sick or something like that, and then just regular health insurance. Health insurance is a complex topic if you're from the U.S. or if you're traveling to the U.S. because we have this bizarre, antiquated, private insurance model that virtually no other country has. I mean, that's not true, but most civilized countries in the world have some form of socialized medicine, and for some reason we can't get our act together. And this causes problems because when you go to a country that does have socialized medicine, they're not required to pay for you because you haven't been paying into their tax system. And with COVID, a lot of them require special policies. So when I went to Uruguay and Argentina, I had these problems like how, what do they need and everything. Anyway, Square Mouth sorted it all out and it wasn't even very expensive. So if you are traveling and you need some sort of travel policy and you know, any kind of travel policy. If you're going on a cruise, if you need sports policies, like you need a special policy because you're going to go scuba diving in a foreign country, all that kind of stuff, check out Square Mouth. And I really like the fact that they're not selling insurance directly. They're just basically, here's a list of 20 companies that have insurance for you. Choose the one you like. And they're real companies. I ended up getting my health insurance from Blue Cross Blue Shield through Square Mouth. And yeah, technically I didn't need it. I was actually triple covered on my trip. But the reason I did it is that they gave me an easy document that I could show people that showed I was covered. I basically spent 30 bucks for easier paperwork. And well, if you've ever traveled internationally, that that can be $30 well spent. So check it out, squaremouth.com, an excellent place to find travel insurance. And it's actually the site that I send my travel clients to whenever I can. Well, folks, that's it for episode 152. Thank you very, very much for joining me once again. Music, as always, is by Simon Wagg. And if you need to get a hold of me for any reason, if you would like to do an interview, sure, why not? I'm Jeff at builtogo.com. That's two T's, not three, not one. And until next time, remember the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, Do what you feel in your heart to be right for you'll be criticized anyway.